Well, I'm really excited and thank you for having me at, at Shift Mobility. Uh, and, and I'm excited because I think I've struck upon a mobility solution that could really excite the venture capitalists who are prepared to put so much money in uh, around the world into yeah. shaping the future of mobility. Um, and let me tell you why I'm excited and why the venture capitalists should be excited. Um, because first of all, this solution is going to increase access to mobility uh, to a great extent. Secondly, you don't need to be able to drive a vehicle to take advantage of this mobility solution. Uh, and it's going to be safe, or at least good for your public uh, health. And of course, most importantly, uh, it can help make you money. Uh, and it's called walking as a service. This image has become very typical uh, of what we've seen in the debates around future mobility. In fact, some people almost seem to presume uh, that the future can be defined by case, or if you want to rearrange the letter ACES, um, the hand of ACES in the pack for the future, connected, autonomous, shared, and electric. But what you'll notice in that depiction of future mobility is one common theme. It's all based upon motorized vehicles. Meanwhile, if we turn to the dictionary, I'm always keen to go back to, to base definitions. Um, what about the pedestrian? Let's move outside the vehicle. Uh, well, of course, we know that that's a person walking rather than traveling in a vehicle. But when we look at the adjective, it tells us that it's lacking inspiration or excitement. It's dull. So no wonder there's been very little attention given to walking uh, when we talk about the future of mobility. And yet I'd like to suggest to you that far from being dull, walking combined with the very best capability that Silicon Valley has to offer really represents the smartest solution for the future of mobility. And let's just take a look at some, some numbers, first of all. Apologies, these are from, uh, from the UK specifically, in fact, from, from England. Uh, what's going on when we consider walking? Well, first of all, 45%, nearly half of all journeys by urban residents are under two miles. Those are journeys which for many could be walkable. And in fact, the majority are, 81% of trips uh, under one mile are walked. But when we look to trips between one and two miles, that drops dramatically to only 30%. And yet it's been estimated in London uh, alone that on a daily basis, there are some 3.6 million journeys that could be walked, at least in part. And what I found really intriguing uh, was to observe that over the last three years in England, according to our National Travel Survey, the number of walking trips under one mile has gone up by over 30%, which leads me to ask, why could that be? Um, because on the face of it, it looks exciting to me. It's a, a, the prospect of a walking renaissance. And in fact, I engage with people uh, on LinkedIn and ask that same question to them. Why have we seen such a dramatic increase in walking over the last three years? Uh, and a whole series of suggestions came through. Um, the first of which is that, well, maybe the data's just wrong. Don't get too excited. Um, but I'm keen to remain excited. I won't run through all of the uh, suggested explanations. I'll certainly be coming back to number six there, which is it's now become easier to wayfind and judge time and distance. This is at the heart of walking as a service. Um, but notable also is that we seem to be placing greater importance now or greater awareness concerning the, the need for physical activity in our lives for our own health and well-being. Uh, and technology is already coming to our aid there uh, and influencing uh, psycho psychologically our behaviour. Uh, so, for example, um, the ability to know how many steps we've taken in a day uh, and how many we should be taken, taking for our, for our fitness and good health. Uh, and even gamification with the likes of Pokemon Go uh, and augmented reality. But perhaps also because far from being the poor person's mode, which you revert to uh, as a last resort, perhaps people increasingly now are walking because they want to, not just because they have to. So moving in towards walking as a service, one of the challenges with the choice to walk rather than use other modes uh, when one's uh, going to a destination is the, that there are these three questions that confront us, which we may be uncomfortable about finding answers to. Well, how, how would I get there? 
how far is it to get there and how long is it going to take? Uh, so there are issues of wayfinding and being able to judge time and distance. And I can just draw your attention here to the building in the diagram on the screen. It's called the Mad Hatter Hotel. And it happens to be an important landmark for me when I walk from London Waterloo Station uh, to my place of employment in London with Mott MacDonald. And we'll come back to that. In fact, we'll come back right now. Uh, and so here we see what Google have been up to over a period of many years now uh, in what I would suggest is harnessing the power of geography. So that Mad Hatter Hotel uh, has gone from the physical space into the virtual representation. Uh, and you'll note importantly that it's not just showing me where the Mad Hatter Hotel is on that map of the city, but it's also telling, uh, telling me how much I can pay or would need to pay to book a room overnight in that hotel. So there seems to be something going on here in terms of the relationship between geography, mobility and economic activity. And this led me to thinking about the prospect of what I then called walking as a service. Uh, and I posted something uh, on LinkedIn just over a year ago, and I'll read it out briefly for you. I just walked the last two days in London between multiple locations, no bus, no tube, no Uber, no bike, thanks to a major new innovation, a major new innovative collaboration between Google Maps and my new desert boots called Walking as a Service. It was a bit of fun at the time, uh, but it generated, as you may be able to see there, nearly 40,000 views and lots of interest and discussion. Was there something going on here? Well, some people, of course, thought I really had invented something brand new uh, and it was something new technologically to get excited about. But all I was really doing was observing, uh, as William Gibson has said, that the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Google Maps navigation is allowing us to address those three questions that get in the way of us being confident about walking. I know how to get to my destination, I know how long it will take, and I know how far it is. And what becomes really interesting for me, and I think important when we're trying to position this proposition of walking as a service, particularly in contrast to mobility as a service, which has had a lot of hype and excitement and research and investment going into it. What's exciting about walking as a service is that it represents potentially a win-win-win situation. So businesses are encouraged to put their premises into the Google Maps ecosystem so that they can be visible uh, in that mapping layer. That's really useful for me because the Mad Hatter Hotel is a landmark for me. And having all of that mapping, all of those landmarks placed inside the Google Map gives me more confidence to be able to undertake my journey on foot. So it encourages uh, more walking to take place. The proprietors of those businesses get the potential benefit of more passing trade. There's footfall quite literally uh, coming into those businesses through increased visibility in the mapping layer. And the provider, Google Maps in this case, uh, also stands to gain because ultimately we all represent clickbait and it's possible to sell that access to geography. And you'll perhaps be aware, those of you that use Google Maps navigation, um, that the innovation continues uh, with the prospect that augmented reality can be used to make it even more usable um, than I have the impression it is already. So what about walking inside mobility as a service. Uh, I don't have time to explain mobility as a service, but I'm hoping you have a feel for that. Uber is a good example. It's having mobility, access to mobility in the palm of your hand through a single app. Uh, what you'll notice if you look closely is that it's very hard to find uh, any evidence of walking being incorporated within mobility as a service. Because of course, these mobility intermediaries that are now offering up mass are selling access to mobility. And there's no money, money to be made, it would seem, in selling access to walking. The one exception here is with, with Uber Express Pool, where you're encouraged or obliged to do some walking in order to make the system more efficient for the motorized vehicles. And coming more hard-nosed uh, from a business perspective here, uh, one can contrast mobility as a service with walking as a service. 
Mobility as a service is about selling access to mobility. And frankly, it seems to be struggling to establish a really credible business model foundation for, for growing that proposition. Whereas walking as a service is already with us. And I would imagine many of you listening to this presentation have already made use of walking as a service in terms of Google Maps navigation to help you on a, on a journey by foot. WAS is selling access to geography, but it's also selling access to consumers. And as the saying goes, if a product is free, then you are the product. So coming towards a conclusion, what I've suggested here is the prospect of a WAS circle of virtue. So just bear with me as I explain that. So if we imagine that urban authorities are, I would hope, making further investment in the walkability of their cities and towns. That starts to unlock the appeal of walking, but unlocked even more by the likes of Google, investing in improvement in the navigability of the built environment. Those two together create the prospect of an increase in walking, which may be explained by the statistics I shared with you earlier. As we see an increase in walking, there's more passing trade, um, and therefore, there's an increase in profit, not only a profit for Google, but a profit for those businesses that appear in the Google Maps ecosystem. That, in turn, leads to a growth in the local economy. And that growth in the local economy predisposes the local authority to have more resources to invest once again in walkability. And so that circle of virtue continues, which potentially, as I mentioned earlier, creates a win-win-win situation. And just to conclude, looking to the future, well, first of all, I see an important distinction if we play around with the acronym somewhat uh, between walking aimed at shareholders and walking aimed at sustainability. And the same can be said for mobility as a service. The real question is, can we find that sweet spot in the middle where it's attractive for commercial investment to prioritise walking, but it's also attractive, of course, because walking helps underpin and fundamentally already does underpin sustainability in these critical times of the climate emergency. Now, of course, over the last few months, uh, we've been thrown a real challenge in the form of the pandemic, COVID-19. And that, I think, raises questions for the place of walking over the coming months and years. One of the great appeals of walking as a service is that it's helping unlock those unfamiliar journeys that you might not otherwise have made on foot. And yet right at the moment, we're making less use of those types of journeys. We're living local and acting global um, through digital connectivity. But nevertheless, reassuringly, national and local policy documents such as this from the UK continue to stress that walking surely has to be the best option for those short urban journeys. So let's put our best foot forward and see walking as critical and central to the future of mobility. And with that, thank you very much. I'll hand back um, to the stage. Thank you, Glenn. That was a very interesting look at walking. Why do you think it is that walking is so often overlooked as such a central piece uh, of mobility? Is it because, as you said, it is essentially free? It's a free service? I think it's a combination of factors, but looking back over the decades during which we've all grown up, uh, it's been a car-centric existence to our lives, even if we haven't owned a car. Uh, and the psychological hierarchy of modes pushes walking to the bottom. Hmm. Uh, if you see someone walking, it's because they can't afford to own a car or they can't afford uh, to take an Uber or perhaps even make use of a bus for those shorter journeys. Um, and I think that has suppressed the prospects and appeal of walking. But I also come back to the harsh reality of us existing um, in a capitalist system where, frankly, mobility has to make money. Uh, and if you're innovating, if you're investing uh, in mobility solutions, you have to be able to uh, ultimately de deliver a dividend to your shareholders if you're in the private sector. And it's been very difficult to see where walking fits into that, whereas the, the, the seduction of autonomous vehicles and, and mobility as a service more apparently um, brings up the dollar signs. 
What about how walking may or may not complement other forms of mobility? In the UK, not too far from where you are, the first Cyclops juncture was uh, recently unveiled. This is this bus station that has made essentially seamless traffic for bicyclists. And there were complaints there from pedestrians and also disabled people who said that they didn't feel like uh, they had the ability to safely move through this juncture because it had made, been made into essentially a bicycle street. So how do you balance those contradictory needs at times? I think that's a really good question. We, we are at a point now, and we're seeing this particularly in the UK um, with what are, what are called uh, low traffic neighbourhoods, where um, it really is war on our streets um, be between the old regime of the car being king uh, and a new paradigm where alternative modes to the car, particularly in the realms of micromobility and active travel, come to the fore. And perhaps we've not experienced previously this clash between different um, active travel modes. Uh, and I experienced this in London. We have the cycling superhighways alongside heavy pedestrian footfall mixed in with motorised traffic. Uh, and I don't think there are easy answers, but these are the issues that we should be prioritising, um, I think, instead of being lured and seduced by um, the larger scale technological fixes that seem to be on offer in the form of motorized mobility. We will leave it there. Glenn Lyons, Professor of Future Mobility at the University of the West of England in Bristol. Thank you so much for joining us here at Shift Mobility. My pleasure. Thank you very much.